Our second speaker is Dr. Jason Hawk, who is a Malaysian. He is an immunology and allergy physician based in Melbourne. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jason Folk. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at this conference today. Standard disclosure. So um, the topic today is what's new in chronic spontaneous surgery. Sorry, what's new in chronic urgic area? Um, the outline of my talk will consist of introduction and in biomarkers predicting treatment response in chronic spontaneous urgic area, and a new perspective in urgic area treatment and um, differential diagnosis of hives, uh, and what's new in chronic inducible urgic area. I'm sure we don't need any much um, introduction about the morphology of the pictures shown on the screen. So this is what we call urgic area or hives or whales. It is unprompted occurrence of whales, angel edema or both for more than six weeks. It is said that about one third of two thirds of cases exhibit both wheels and injury edema. And this condition affects 1% of the general population. It has an unpredictable cause and duration. And many patients suffer for more than one year. Uh, in about 11 to 14% of patients suffer for more than five years. So the peak age of chronic spontaneous urgic area patients are between 20 to 40 years old so in most studies. And this understandably means that patients are primarily affected during the most important, the important years of their working age. So as mentioned before, um, it causes impact quality of life and has significant or marked impact on interpersonal relationship, work, uh, social functioning and sleep. And it has been demonstrated in different studies recently that it has had impact on sexual function. Um, sleep disorders, as well as uh, psychiatric condition, including depression and anxiety. So management of chronic spontaneous urticaria can be time consuming and leads to substantial economic burden. Therefore, appropriate effective treatment is important. So in recent years, um, specific markers, including clinical and laboratory um, parameters of chronic spontaneous urticaria that may predict the response to um, treatment, including Second generation antihistamines, omelizumab, cyclosporine have been described. What you see on the screen here is just part of the markers that have been described, and there are many, many more described in the literature. So, in the recent uh, systematic review that we published this year, we um, looked at potential predictors of non response and response to the main uh, state of um, treatments in chronic spontaneous surgical area. So um, for non-response to second generation antihistamine, um, we have identified a high baseline urticaria activity score seven, uh, higher level of CRP and higher level of D-dimer, uh, showing uh, being strong level of evidence predicting non-response to um, second generation antihistamine. So um, there are actually two different studies that link the um, high urticaria activity score, which demonstrate an uh, odds ratio of statistically significant p-value, uh, and also higher CRP has been described in non-response, as well as uh, having demonstrating more active disease. Whereas uh, in about one third of a CSU patient, uh, we find that there are high levels of D-dimer, which has been linked with more severe disease, as well as being linked with recurrent angel edema uh, and associated with autoantibodies, including thyroid autoantibodies and uh, anti-nuclear antibodies. Um, there are also um, a few um, other, uh, other predictors that has been identified demonstrating weaker level of evidence uh, in uh, predicting non-response to uh, second-generation antihistamines. This include a uh, previous treatment with corticosteroids, uh, concomitant chronic inducible urticaria, such as symptomatic demographism and delayed pressure urticaria, uh, as well as a low chronic urticaria, a quality of life um, um, questionnaire score. Let's move on to um, non-response to omelizumab. And further studies have also demonstrated uh, a baseline low total IgE level uh, as a strong level of evidence predicting non-response to omelizumab. Um, and um, the next slide is um, predictors uh, predicting response to the fourth line of um, current CSU treatment based on the latest algorithm internationally. Uh, it is 
uh, a marker of response to cyclosporine. Um, so we um, have a positive BHRA uh, demonstrating strong levels of evidence. So BRH is actually a um, base of fuel histamine release assay. Uh, and we have a low total IgE uh, demonstrating as weak level of uh, evidence. Um, so when you look at the IgE, it's actually a comparison between the non-responders and the responders uh, and um, as a comparative value. So in recent years, uh, in more recent years, there have been quite a few new players identified in uh, the pathogenesis of um, chronic spontaneous urticaria. And with this uh, new potential treatment uh, in, uh, in the horizon, offering new hope in treating this disease. Um, so this diagram may seem a little bit busy and complicated, but essentially it summarizes quite a few uh, new players um, currently available based on quite a few papers published uh, very recently. So um, we have a, the BTK um, inhibitor, which, which acts at blocking specific signal tran transduction pathway involved in mast cells activation. The examples are remibrutinib and finibrutinib. And we have this um, siglet A, anti siglet A, which is essentially a mast cell silencer. Uh, via inhibitory uh, receptors, and the example includes a uh, lirantilumab, AK002, uh, which leads to extensive depletion of eosinophil, and it has been demonstrated uh, in uh, CSU cases of uh, omelizumab naive and omelizumab refractory um, uh, scenarios. Um, and I'm sure many in the audience are familiar with a anti-IgA therapy, the omelizumab. And another new medication that has been uh, used recently is a legally zumab, which binds more potently um, for FC epsilon R1 than the FC epsilon R2 or CD23. Therefore, this is what makes it quite different from the omelizumab pathway. So the next slide uh, summarizes um, a, a very nicely written paper published uh, this year as well, which looks at basically the different new players and the new um, pathway targeted by new therapy uh, in the pathogenesis of chronic spontaneous urticaria. So as in clinical practice, uh, sometimes a disease may not seem like how it is presented. Um, so there are quite a few, like any other diseases, we, as clinicians, we should always bear in mind certain differential diagnosis for um, con um, specific conditions. And th th there's no exception to chronic spontaneous urticaria as well. Uh, whilst it is important to confirm the diagnosis, uh, it is also uh, because this will lead to the most appropriate uh, treatment plan and therefore achieving um, um, good prognosis results for a patient. Um, sometimes just by taking um, a detailed history may not be sufficient. Uh, as in most dermatological uh, diseases, verifications of uh, specific diseases um, uh, using um, clinical photos uh, would be very important to clinch the diagnosis. Uh, and if a treatment uh, initiated to treat a particular disease does not achieve a desired uh, result, uh, it is important to step back and then think outside the box and uh, consider other differential diagnoses that might be at play. Uh, because uh, certainly there are quite a few conditions that can mimic the morphology of urticaria or hive. So classically, CSU is an itchy, highly pruritic condition. Uh, some of the differential diagnoses that we're going to talk about uh, um, may not be necessarily itchy. In fact, they may be painful, uh, indicating underlying inflammation. So in one of the papers that's published um, this year, uh, this paper looks at um, 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 differential diagnosis for chronic spontaneous urticaria. Uh, and uh, in patients with um, wheels only, it is important to uh, consider other differential diagnoses such as urticaria vasculitis, which essentially uh, can be burning in nature, may be associated with arthralgia, and when the skin lesions heal, it may leave a mark on the pigmentation. Um, the way to investigate uh, skin biopsy would be helpful, along with a, 
um, investigating with serum complements level. Uh, Schlitzer syndrome uh, is a rare condition. Yeah, it is a um, uh, condition characterized by um, urticaria as well as joint pain, a high fever of more than 40 degrees, but importantly, uh, the hallmark of the disease is a monoclonal uh, gammopathy, which um, can, could be IgM or IgG. Um, and when you perform a skin biopsy, uh, the hallmark of the disease will show you um, neutrophilic infiltration. There are quite a few uh, testing which can be performed uh, by drawing serum, including amyloid A and S100, which is essentially a regulator of a macrophage uh, inflammation. Uh, um, not forgetting CAPS, uh, cryopyrite associated periodic syndrome, uh, which is associated with a mutation uh, in NLRP3 gene uh, and um, a skin biopsy, inflammatory um, markers and serum amyloid will be helpful in this regard as well. And uh, Steele's disease, um, which can be characterized by a high ferritin level um, and um, um, derangement in liver enzymes. And not forgetting with wheels, always consider chronic inducible urticaria, which we're going to talk about uh, in the next few slides. And it can be triggered by uh, physical triggers. Um, with patient with angel edema only, um, um, other conditions like ACE inhibitor, hereditary angel edema and acquired angel edema needs to be uh, considered. Um, um, for chronic inducible urticaria, this is a form of urticaria that can be triggered by physical stimulus. And the examples are well summarized in um, the slides, what you can see here. And uh, this is one example of demographism. Uh, and this is taken from uh, uh, a um, a, a paper in recent years uh, highlighting the different subtype of Sindhu, uh, the associated trigger and the prevalence. And this is one of the largest North American study looking at the characteristics of um, Sindhu in a pediatric cohort consisting of 64 patients. Uh, and another example of a use of umelizumab uh, deriving from a systematic review, um, particularly involving three Phase two studies are uh, looking at solar urticaria, co-induced urticaria, and demographism. Uh, and lastly, um, a more regional study, which is close to us, in which took place in Korea, and then look at a retrospective study of 27 patients uh, demonstrating good efficacy of omelizumab uh, in cholinergic urticaria patients. So uh, cholinergic urticaria uh, essentially is uh, associated with increased secretion or hypersensitivity to acetylcholine. Uh, and the hallmark of the disease is wheels appearing in the satellite distribution, quite different from uh, the typical chronic spontaneous urticarial morphology. And it can be precipitated by exercise or a warming of the body. Um, and to me, this is a condition that must be uh, differentiated from exercise uh, induced anaphylaxis. Uh, which can be uh, associated with certain cofactors such as um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, like ibuprofen as well as alcohol uh, and the different types of physical activities being involved and has been described, uh, for example, brisk walking or horse riding, which may present with recurrent urticaria at rest as well. Uh, and the way to clinch a diagnosis is by performing an, a blood test called specific IgE to omega-5 gliadine. Uh, which is implicated in weak dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. Um, for cold urticaria, uh, it constitutes um, to about one third of all cases of physical urticaria. Uh, it can be dangerous because when it progress, progresses sy systematically, it can cause um, cold anaphylaxis. And uh, umelizumab has been demonstrated to be uh, an effective treatment uh, in um, reduction in critical temperature threshold. So a recent systematic review um, of 16 studies have also uh, confirmed um, the result, uh, the efficacy of using omelizumab um, in uh, cold urticaria. Uh, with this, uh, thank you for listening. I'm happy to introduce my friend, Professor Panchama Pachan. She is currently a pediatric allergy of the Allergy and Immunology Division, the Department of Pediatrics at Sri Hospital at Mahido University. 
She is also a clinician scientist with research interests in food allergy and immunotherapy, in particular wheat and shellfish allergy, and recently precision medicine in the field of uh, food allergy. So uh, my topic is about managing the practical challenges in oral immunotherapy. Among different routes of food immunotherapy, oral immunotherapy has the highest efficacy, but it also has the least safety compared to the other routes. In general, the my adverse events are found in about two to 5% of doses, mainly abdominal symptoms, and up to 24% of patients have symptoms that require epinephrine for the treatment. Today, I will focus on and how to prevent and manage the adverse event in OIT. Adverse events during OIT may trigger by cofactors such as exercise, the insects, infection, dehydration, menstruation, or sleep deprivation. These factors may increase the intestinal permeability and absorption of allergens or can increase the blood circulation and influx of allergens, or it can direct uh, effect on mast cell and basophil activation. But sometimes patients with OIT develop adverse events despite had none of these factors. The clinical features of OIT patients who have exercise-induced allergic reactions were investigated. This study enrolled 25 patients who underwent with OIT, and the exercise challenge was performed after patients on maintenance dose for three months. If they had positive results, the exercise challenge test was repeated. They found that 21 patients achieved full dose OIT, and about 66% of them had exercise induced allergic reaction. And this reaction still persists after five years in 52% of patients. When compared between patients who had exercise induced allergic reaction or not, they found no difference in clinical characteristics between two groups, except in EIARD positive patients show significantly higher specific IgE level to wheat. And you can see from this table, the EIARD positive patients had wheat specific IgE level at the baseline about 100 compared to 21.7 in EIARD negative group. And also the gliadin and glutenin components that higher in EIARD positive group, as you can see from this table. Our group reviewed the medical records in patients who underwent with OIT and divided them into complicated and uncomplicated cases. The definition of complicated cases is those who had grade two reactions more than two times, or patients who deviated from protocols or dropped out from OIT. And the objective of our study is to identify factors that predict complicated with OIT. We found that most patients could not identify the trigger of allergic reactions during OIT. And the most common causes that can be identified are exercise or infection. And when we compare the specific IgE between the complicated cases and uncomplicated group, the baseline with specific IgE level in the complicated group was significantly higher than the uncomplicated group. The general recommendation for OIT treatment to decrease the adverse events, including taking the daily doses, not taking doses on empty stomachs, and reducing or withholding the dose during infection, asthma exacerbation, GI diseases, or menstruation. However, some patients still develop reactions despite strictly follow to this guideline. 
The adverse events from OIT could be reduced by combining OIT with monoclonal antibodies or, anti or probiotics, or by decreasing the maintenance dose to the low dose OIT, or using the big product for OIT. First, I will talk about the use of monoclonal antibody for OIT. There are three monoclonal antibodies that have been studied for food immunotherapy. Omalizumab is the monoclonal antibody that has been successfully used as an adjunctive treatment with OIT. It binds the circulating IgE and prevents the IgE from binding to FC epsilon R1. And dupilumab is an anti-IL4 receptor and uh, etocumab is an anti-IL-33. Both dupilumab and etocumab studies are still in phase two trial or some in clinical trials. So today I will talk about only the use of omalizumab with OIT. A study in peanut OIT showed the use of omalizumab could facilitate oral desensitization. They randomized patients to have omalizumab or placebo 12 weeks before OIT. Then subjects underwent rapid one-day desensitization of up to 250 mg of peanut protein, followed by weekly increases up to 2,000 mg of peanut protein. And this figure show the median tolerate dose between two groups during the rapid desensitization phase. And you can see that the median tolerate dose was significantly higher in the omalizumab group compared to placebo. And omalizumab was used until the 19th week. Then the OFC was performed at the sixth week after this continuing omalizumab. And they found that about 74% of the omalizumab group can tolerate 2,000 mg of peanut protein compared to only 12.5% in the placebo group. And at the 12th week after stopping the omalizumab, patients were OFC with four grams of peanut protein. And they found that the omalizumab group can sustain desensitization more than the placebo group, as you can see from this table, like 76% compared to only 12.5%. And there's a study to investigate the sustained desensitization after stopping the omalizumab. They enrolled patients with multiple food allergies and treated them with omalizumab for 16 weeks. The OIT was started at the eighth week and then gradually increased the dose to one gram per allergen. Then at the 30th week, they were randomized to have 1,000 milligram per allergen, 300 per allergen, or discontinued the OIT. And the primary endpoint was the percentage of patients who tolerated two grams of food, at least two allergens at the 36 weeks. And the secondary endpoint was the percentage of patients who tolerated two grams of three, four, and five allergens, and those who passed four grams more than two allergens. And they found that those who continued the OIT, which you can see the red bar, had a significantly higher percentage of patients who passed the OFC than those who discontinued the OIT. And when divided patients who had one gram and 300 milligram of peanut, the percentage of those who passed two gram OFC were not significantly different between the one gram and 300 milligram. So it means that the sustained desensitization best occurs through the continued maintenance OIT, whether the higher dose or lower dose compared to the discontinuation of the OIT. However, there's an ongoing study that is supported by NIH and COFA group called the OUMATCH study. 
is the this study compare the effect of long term use of omalizumab monotherapy and the combination of omalizumab and OIT. I think the result of this study will help us understand more about the different methods of using omalizumab for OIT. In summary, the benefits of omalizumab with OIT are that patients can achieve higher initial doses and reach the maintenance dose faster, less adverse reactions, and have more permanent tolerance. Next topic is about the use of probiotics. The first double by RCT that evaluated the effect of a combined probiotic and peanut OIT intervention came from Professor Mimi Tang's group. They randomized children with peanut allergy to receive probiotics with peanut OIT or placebo for 18 weeks. The outcome was the desensitization after two to five weeks after discontinued the treatment. They found that the sustained unresponsiveness was significantly higher in the PPOIT group compared to the placebo, and also the desensitization rate right after the end of the treatment showed that it's higher in the PPOIT group more than the placebo group. In addition, the PPOIT group has significant decrease in peanut-specific IgE and increase in peanut-specific IgG4 compared to placebo. However, this study has no arm of OIT alone, so it's still doubtful whether the effect of the treatment comes from the probiotic or the OIT. So there are two ongoing studies about probiotics. The first is the PIT study, that the study designed quite similar to the previous PPOIT study, but changed the allergen from peanut to egg. And the second study is PPOIT-003. They added the peanut OIT arm to see whether the combination of probiotic with OIT has better efficacy than the OIT alone. So I think we, we will have more information after we see the result from these two studies. The next topic is the use of low-dose OIT. There are many studies uh, about low-dose OIT that come from the group of Professor Yanagida and Professor Ebisawa from Japan, they showed that most patients who underwent low-dose OIT could tolerate low-dose and middle-dose of allergens, especially in peanut. From this figure, the percentage of patients who pass the middle-tolerate dose is shown in blue color. And all the peanut allergic patients had tolerated the middle dose of allergen. In addition, the rate of moderate to severe symptoms and the rate of adrenaline use were significantly lower in the low dose OIT group. However, the question is whether sustained unresponsiveness can be obtained from the low-dose OIT, and the optimal maintenance dose for each food is still not be identified. Recently, there's a study that compared the OIT with regular maintenance dose and the 25% maintenance dose, and then OFC at the first and the second years after OIT. The outcome was the short-term unresponsiveness at two weeks after stopping the OIT. This graph showed the short-term unresponsiveness among egg, cow milk, and wheat. You can see the gray color, which means the short-term unresponsiveness was not significantly different between the regular maintenance dose and the 25 maintenance dose in in, in all group of allergens. However, the reactions in the 25% dose were significantly lower than the regular dose. So this is an interesting option, but long-term sustained unresponsiveness is needed to be evaluated. 
The last topic is OIT with the baked product. This study compared patients with history of milk anaphylaxis who underwent OIT with 3 ml of heated milk or unheated milk for one year, then stop the OIT for two weeks and OFC with the 3 ml and 25 ml of cow's milk. They found that the percentage of patients who pass OFC in those who OIT with heated milk and unheated milk were not significantly different in both the 2 ml OFC and the 25 ml OFC. And the specific IgE for cow's milk was decreased in both groups. The casein IG specific IgG4 level increased in both group after the OIT, but the beta lactoglobulin IgG4 was increased only in the unheated milk group. This can be explained by the heated group has no beta lactoglobulin in it. For big egg, there was a study that challenges patients who had history of baked egg allergy with baked egg. Those who passed the baked egg OFC were randomized to OIT with baked egg or regular egg. And those who failed the baked egg OFC were underwent regular egg OIT. The outcome were the desensitization at first and the second year, and the sustained unresponsiveness at the second year. There were no differences in age and sex between three groups, but the specific IgE for egg white, ovomucoid, and ovalbumin were significantly higher in those who failed the big egg or FC, as you can see from this table. The outcome at the second year showed that the desensitization rate and the sustained unresponsiveness were significantly highest in those who OIT with regular egg. And interestingly that those who failed the big egg or FC at the beginning, which seems to have the worst prognosis, show that after the OIT with regular egg, they had the rate of desensitization and sustained unresponsiveness higher than those who OIT with big egg. In on conclusion, the adverse events in OIT are common. The exercise in this reaction may be re related to the initial specific IgE level. The omalizumab helps OIT patients have a higher initial dose and achieve the target dose faster. The low dose OIT has less adverse events but the problem is we still don't know the exact dose to maintain the efficacy of OIT. And OIT with baked product has less adverse events, but also has less efficacy. I would like to thank my faculty of medicine, Sirat Hospital, and also Smithy Red Allergy Institute. We keep working to improve the outcome of OIT in our patients. Thank you for your attention. So you. the first questions uh, we direct to uh, Panchama. What is the prevalence of wheat allergy in Thailand? Do those patients in your wheat uh, OIT trial have a severe reactions before the trial? Okay, thank you for your question. So we don't have the exact prevalence of wheat allergy in Thailand, but we have the prevalence of food allergy in, in Thai children. Uh, it's about like 5% for the parent-based questionnaire, uh, but the challenge proof prevalence is about only 1%. So the, the wheat allergy patient, the wheat prevalence allergy is maybe lower than that. And uh, in our series, we have about 75% of our patients who have history of wheat anaphylaxis. So most of our, our patients quite have severe reaction. Thank you, Koi. Thank you, uh, Professor Pachan. Can I add on to that? Um, mm -hmm. You have a lot of experience in treating patients with wheat oral immunotherapy. In what form of the wheat given to patient you found most acceptable? 
Okay, so like at the beginning, a uh, patient has to uh, receive wheat flour because the in patient who have severe reaction, most of them can tolerate only like between 30 to 100 milligram of wheat flour. But later after that in Thailand, we use bread, a slice of bread and sometimes because patient has to eat every day. So they quite bored about the, the bread. So maybe they can change to uh, pasta, macaroni, spaghetti, or sometimes like instant noodles that uh, patients really like it. That sounds really nice. Um, <laughs> during the COVID pandemic, how would you like treat these patients coming in with adverse reactions because of the, we have lockdowns in different parts of the world. How did you handle that? Yeah, I think it depends on what uh, fits for the patient because if the patient in the maintenance phase, we just like keep patient on the at the same dose. But uh, during the build up phase, uh, we delay the appointment because sometimes some patient like uh, ask me to can they challenge at home and increase the, the dose at home. And one of my patients like try to increase a little bit by, by themselves and they have reaction. And then it, uh, they had anaphylaxis and has to come to the hospital. So uh, I'm not recommend to increase the dose at home. We can delay a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Pachan. While we are on the COVID-19 pandemic, can I direct a question to Professor Zhang? Um, we've got a question here. Um, can, would you be able to highlight the relation of allergic rhinitis and um, the use of biologics during the COVID time? I'm sure there are a lot of restrictions elsewhere in the world. So while they're on the biologics um, and during the COVID breakdown, how would you handle the situation? Would you have like to highlight some of the like the challenges that you faced. Uh, uh, you know, uh, for allergic rhinitis now, I think uh, the most uh, uh, important thing is for the patients, they have not very good adherence for the uh, medication uh, standard the medication. And so for uh, for us, the most important thing is find a cost effective way uh, uh, um, strategy for the patients. On the one hand, we should, uh, um, the, and the most uh, important thing is how to control the patient's uh, symptom and uh, improve their quality of life. And so uh, for uh, the biologics, it, for example, uh, the patients with um, primary allergic rhinitis, I think it's not uh, sim uh, si suitable because, you know, uh, biologics are always very, Impensive, and so uh, I think so. Um, in present study, I show just now it's just for the seasonal allergic rhinitis because uh, when they are uh, uh, exposed in a high uh, sensitization of the uh, the pollen, I think the uh, uh, the majority of the patient cannot be controlled well uh, in the uh, the uh, in the pollen season, and so we want to find a cost effective way uh, and uh, also. So meanwhile, uh, it has a uh, very uh, good safety and the tool uh, gave the patients well uh, uh, disease control. Yeah, I think the challenge is how to balance these factors. Thank okay. you. Yeah, Professor Chang, there's another question for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, how, how do you, uh, how, what do you give to your patients? Uh, can you mention all for allergy rhinitis? The pharmacological mean, treatment that you give to your patients? Uh, just the, the pharmacotherapy? Yes, all the medicine that you, you give to your patient. Um, uh, if the patient is just, uh, for example, they are allergic to hasta diet, uh, mite, um, maybe I think it's just uh, for the medication and uh, for the uh, allergen avoidance. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, if the, uh, the medication, they cannot uh, control their uh, symptom well, I will uh, suggest them to do the uh, immunotherapy. And the medication, the first line is always uh, uh, such as antihistamine. Uh, and, uh, the, 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 uh, and meanwhile, that is the nasal spray of the steroid and uh, uh, just uh, 
um, I think this two kind of the uh, medication is the most popular and most common uh, in our clinic. And but uh, if uh, they are uh, um, allergic to the uh, uh, pollen, maybe uh, in the pollen season, I will uh, uh, suggest them to do some biologics ahead of the pollen season, and then they will uh, very happy to uh, just uh, experience this uh, season. Yeah, thank you for your uh, question. Okay, uh, there, there is a question for Prof. Chow Jie, uh, in regards to sleep, as described in the topic, working for better asthma control, we find that in our pediatric populations that the main factor to failure of sleep in this group is compliance. So over the course of uh, first and second year, maybe many families find compliance uh, a hurdle that sends them to skip. Can you suggest any methods to improve this compliance? This, uh, as uh, Prof. Xiao Jie is, uh, uh, is having a walk around, then uh, we will address this issue to her uh, by emails. Uh, hopefully, she will address, she will come back to us uh, with, uh, with her answer in the internet. So, uh, there are some questions for me. Okay, uh, any, uh, is there any uh, genomic examination to predict someone who has probability of uh, drug allergy? Uh, yes, so there are some uh, pharmacogenetic study or, or tests that you can do for pre-prescribing uh, uh, the assessment. So for example, uh, but this uh, pharmacogenetic study is specific for certain drugs, for example, uh, carbamazepine and alloprino. For carbamazepine, you can test the HLA 1502, B1502, and uh, for alloprino, B5801. But uh, again, this uh, uh, pharmacogenetic study uh, uh, also is, uh, depends on the availability and also uh, whether it's cost effective in that population. You have to look at the allele frequency of the, uh, of the populations and then how high is the allergic reactions, uh, for example, severe cutaneous uh, uh, adverse drug reactions in, uh, in uh, allopurinol and also whether you have an alternative, a, a very cheap alternative for the, for the drugs. So, uh, so a lot of uh, uh, populations, if uh, it was uh, found that uh, you can do pre-prescribing uh, assessment uh, with, with uh, HLA B1502 for carbamazepine, uh, but not cost effective for allopurinol. So another question for me, how do you maximize uh, the the efficacy with least side effects uh, when we prescribe uh, any drugs. Of course, uh, uh, by experience and also by all the uh, clinical data that we have uh, regarding the side effects of, the pay, uh, of any drugs, and uh, you have to discuss the medication before you prescribe to, be, before you prescribe to them. So uh, yeah, so if let's say the drugs is not really indicated, uh, maybe you should hold on and then or, or before, if the one drug is, uh, is indicated to the clinical situation but has a lot of uh, side effects or allergies, you have to inform the patients uh, properly and then uh, preempt them. If anything happens, you have to stop the medication immediately and come to the, to the hospital or the clinics. So another one is what are the strategies to diagnose and treat adverse drug reactions? Commonly prescribed drugs such as uh, fluoroquinolone, uh, cephalosporin and NSAIDs. Again, uh, this is uh, almost similar to what I have answered. So if you want to diagnose, if you want to, you want to treat, you want to, you want to prescribe, okay, so you make sure you, there's a good indications and anything arise, okay, uh, you ask the patient come to the clinic early or to the prescribing doctors early and then stop the medications and uh, you can treat, uh, you can treat the uh, symptoms uh, uh, symptom by antihistamines or prednisolones if indicated. All right, and then someone asked me about ketoprofen, uh, ketotifren. All right, that is the antihistamines, uh, but it has a lot of uh, uh, sedative effect. All right, so another questions for Dr. Falk. Could you share your experience using psychosporin in chronic spontaneous urticaria? Yeah, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, I think I'll just address um, the two questions at the same time. 
Um, looking back at the screen, uh, I think there was another question about, um, someone asked about what is the next best step to treat a patient who is on three doses of antihistamine and um, coupled with H2 antagonist in the setting of um, um, not being able to access omelizumab. I think in this setting, um, if you look at the international guidelines, uh, the um, uh, Galen 2 guideline, WAO and ERT guideline, we tend to uh, up dose antihistamine, second generation antihistamine up to four um, doses. Yeah, four doses. Uh, uh, and um, next we move up to um, omelizumab. Uh, if omelizumab is not available, uh, uh, in different countries, um, I would suggest, you know, um, you can either um, use cyclosporine, yeah, cyclosporine, or potentially, you know, approach a pharmaceutical company for compassionate use of uh, omelizumab, yeah, um, which is, I, I, I think, can be negotiated. Uh, and, and the next question is about sharing experience about cyclosporine uh, in chronic urticaria patients. It definitely, evidence have shown that it definitely uh, helps. Yeah, uh, patients have achieved uh, uh, improvement on cyclosporine, uh, but most of my patients in my clinic, um, we tend to use omelizumab um, um, in our setting, yeah. But if you look at national guidelines, cyclosporine definitely uh, is an efficacious, effective treatment, yeah. Yeah, or maybe Dr. Tank can share the experience as well, yeah. Okay, so uh, actually, uh, uh, I have a question for Dr. Panchama. Do you have any experience with a seafood or oral immunotherapy? Yeah, uh, I just start uh, my research about uh, trim oral immunotherapy. But unfortunately, because the COVID-19 situation in our country, so like, we have to like postpone for, for a little bit, but we enroll some of the patient, but we cannot like conclude our results yet. So maybe wait a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So Jason, uh, can you uh, elaborate more on the different types of angioedema in your clinical setting? Uh, yes, yeah. So um, one of the slides that I showed earlier uh, was about um, highlighting different types of angel edema. Um, uh, as you know, because angel edema can coexist together with chronic spontaneous urticaria. So uh, in the clinical setting, uh, as we see most of the cases of the angel edema, they are, they are either related to a recurrent idiopathic histamine uh, mediated type, or uh, and another common setting is ACE inhibitor related uh, angel edema. Yeah, which is bradykinin uh, uh, mediated, uh, and in rarer instances, you know, uh, we encounter hereditary angel edema, uh, which is also bradykinin mediated, uh, and much rarer is the acquired um, angel edema. Um, sorry, angel edema due to acquired C1 esterase deficiency uh, related to underlying uh, lymphoproliferative uh, diseases such as lymphoma. Yeah, but I think by and large, you know, um, a lot of the cases of angel edema that we encounter in the clinic, uh, they have um, a con concomitant uh, chronic um, urticaria at the same time. Uh, and these type of patients, they uh, respond very well to combinations of uh, uh, second generation antihistamines in different uh, doses. Uh, um, and, um, and as I mentioned before, um, and Sometimes, you know, um, I think in, in clinical setting, taking a good history is important. Uh, from time to time, we encounter uh, referrals, you know, uh, from emergency department um, for uh, acute onset of uh, angel edema. Uh, and uh, when you dig more history uh, regarding the patient medication uh, um, chart, you know, you will find that uh, uh, sometimes we encounter ACE inhibitor. Yeah, and the thing about ACE inhibitor related angel edema can be so unpredictable. It can happen at any time course uh, after the commencement of the medication. Uh, we have encountered in the clinical setting, it could be one or two days after starting the ACE inhibitor. It could be, or it could be years later. Yeah, so uh, taking a good look at the medication chart, you know, sometimes can uh, shed some light uh, in the underlying uh, mystery uh, of a case. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for highlighting how important history is. Um, I wanted to follow up on the um, question about omelizumab. So you have uh, talked to us about who are the patients who would benefit most from omelizumab, and we have seen from your slides on the evidence of omelizumab. But how would you like counsel the patients? How long should they be on omelizumab? Like what are the duration and what should they expect if like for financial reasons or any other reason they have to stop it after a while? 
Uh, so, so in the uh, Australian setting, yeah, because uh, it is actually covered uh, under the uh, pharmaceutical benefit scheme, yeah. So, uh, in the first instance, you know, once the patient meets the eligibility criteria in Australia, uh, um, when we apply for melizumab for them, um, we usually start for six months, and then we have a regular follow up and look at the uh, response of treatment uh, in these patients. And then from then on, we can take uh, steps further from six months onwards. Yeah, and uh, um, and 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 we may we may continue for one year. Yeah, and in many instances. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. And I've seen from your slides, um, you talk about the different biologics other than omelizumab. I was wondering, like, for ligizumab or um, other biologics, are there any like other indications other than use of chronic urticaria? Just came out of my mind whether it has been used for treatment of food allergy, perhaps um, Professor Pichan and both um, Dr. Falk can try to address that. Yeah, so the uh, um, one, one of the one of the medications highlighted or included in the previous slide, I think there's a dupilumab uh, and uh, dupilumab is also as, as uh, many of the people in the audience know, it's used in uh, atopic dermatitis. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, there's some other BTK inhibitors. I think they are used in other connective tissue diseases as well. Yeah. So Panchama, do you have any experience with use of other biologics in treating patients with food allergy? I, I have experience only for the omalizumab and and I as uh, in my talk that dupilumab is like still in the clinical trial, but I think uh, we we can we have to wait for the result and uh, the another problem is the cost is very expensive so maybe it's not uh, easy to apply for for the patients in Thailand. That's right. Um, I think I've heard about the use of ligizumab um, and dupilumab, but we'll wait for these exciting results. All right. I'm sure everyone agrees with me that we have uh, had an interesting and fruitful session today. On behalf of Apache, I would like to convey my gratitude to the panelists here today with me for the brilliant se session today. So thank you all uh, for all who participate us to uh, participate uh, with us and please stay tuned for the official opening ceremony at 3 p.m singapore time thank you very much thank bye you bye. we'll see you again thank you thank you